Welcome back, all my 40K fanatics out there. This weekend is WrestleMania weekend, and in honor of this event, I'd like to pay homage to the main event Sunday night and start this video off with saying, so, what do you guys want to talk about? Seems to me, by the, all the flood of the internet, everybody would like to talk about 10th edition. 10th edition has been rumored, now confirmed. 10th edition is the talk, what are we going to see, what's going on? Simplified rules, cats and dogs living together, all this crazy craziness of the crazy going on in this game that we love, Warhammer 40,000. But what does this mean? What does this mean on the table? What should we expect? What can we start preparing for? And what do we play now while we wait for these rules to come out? Well, we can only see so much, and we only know so much going into it, but we can look to the past for what the future may hold. And that means that we're going to go back to the first time we saw Games Workshop release indexes, the first time that we saw this full reset on the mainstream game. Now, the reason I say that as a mainstream game is we've seen the 4 and 3rd edition where the main rulebook had everybody's army rules in it. So this is not the first time that we've seen this happen. However, this, this isn't the second time we've seen this happen. However, the one time that this was most mainstream was when they actually released the indexes on the edition change. And what happened then? What did we see? And what can we look at for the future of 40K from the past and what we've seen with the Games Workshop business model and try and put this all together to get kind of an idea of what the future may hold so that, well, we know what to paint, what models we should work on, where should we take the direction of our favorite faction or... Maybe this is the time to start and build a new army. This is going to be a great time for a lot of new to the game, whether it's new players, new armies, new factions, new models, new bank accounts to hide them from our wives. Just kidding. Uh, new everything. So let's start off with, if you guys haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do turn on the bell for notifications. Like, share, and comment down below. Your comments help me to develop different uh, content for the channel, everything else, and actually after the April GT that I'm going to be going to, I plan on focusing on some more thematic and uh, a thousand points and other games and other concepts. So as we start to forge the narrative on the battlefield, I'd love some more comments and ideas on what we can see, what the battle should be. Maybe you guys can even start up a vote down below. You've seen some of the armies that myself, Lane, and Brian have put on the table. Who's ready to go to war? Who should, where does this big war on Tim's nation need to start with? So all that's out of the way. Let's get to the reason that you're here. What can we learn from the past of these things? So there's a lot, but I'm going to focus on three main subjects. Number one, <clears throat> the indexes themselves and their release and what it did for the competitive environment as far as what was good. Now, there was two major, major hits in the competitive edition. Number one, you, whoever went, I'm sorry, whoever deployed, finished deploying first, went first. So this meant when the indexes hit, people were looking to build the smallest possible army, load everything up in transports. There was people taking just five uh, flyers, uh, three storm ravens, some storm talents, as small of an army as they physically could put down. And what this meant was that they were basically guaranteeing to go first. So they could hit you, do damage, and if you had Storm Ravens, they had Storm Ravens, but you had five, four drops, and they had five drops, you went first, you hit their Ravens, their Ravens couldn't answer, they die, and they lose the game, and you win simply because you went first. This was not good for the environment. It was quickly changed off of that, and I believe went to uh, always rolling for who goes first, I think went into it. So that meant people were less likely to do that. Now, once that shifted away and we looked at the actual indexes, the indexes all very much so supported troops. I remember when I first was playing this competitively, I had like a list with 90 gene stealers in it because they were just unbelievably powerful. And uh, they also dropped the points on them significantly, which uh, was not actually, I don't know who, I don't know if that was a misprint or what, but the point cost that Gene Steelers went to for the time being in the indexes, whoo, 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 man, they were cheap. Uh, so this was an infantry-based environment. 
And I think we're going to see the same thing again. And here's a couple of reasons why. Number one, we see that they're lowering the damage output. So lowering the damage output on all these weapons is, I think, going to be more of a long-term band-aid. I think that we will see the damage reduced down, but then over time, as armies come out and more armies need to achieve identity, specifically Tau. Tau has an identity of having big, mean, nasty guns. And once that happens, then everyone else has to start to try to keep up with it. And because this game gets released over time, we get a codex, then another codex, then another codex in units. I, over time, I think the power creep will happen again. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. Everyone says power creep like it's some terrible swear word of the Warhammer universe. I disagree. I don't think that, I think that that sometimes needs to be the case. Some armies need to get more powerful to push other armies down so that we have a reason to have new books, new this, new that, new everything. So over time, that damage may increase. But initially, we can see that an example being the Termagants have a five up set. Now, if we're reducing the damage, the strength, and the AP of everything, those cheap models, such as the Termagants, with still having a 5-up save, are going to be hard to take down. Uh, it's just massive dice. You know, if you throw enough dice, you're going to hit some of those 5-ups, and those guys are going to live. So, the I, I, does that mean that Horde is going to be the all this winner? Are Orcs and Tyranids going to be the top? Not necessarily, because we still have Space Marines with two wounds. We still have Marines with three up save. We still have cover. We still have Marines that have toughness five with three wounds. You still have Terminators. There's still a lot of just bulk resilience, but this may be an MSU environment. So for me personally, the way I look at it and see it, uh, for going into 10th edition, I'm working on a lot of infantry. I'm working on a lot of uh, squads and bulking up squad size and making sure that my base infantry, my walking infantry, I have maximum squads for them. I have a bunch of Necron warriors. I'm making sure I got those all ready because I think right off the rip, we're going to want a lot of infantry to be able to play the game that they've created initially until we see Codex releases and, and some more of the power and some more of the direction that they're trying to take the game. Uh, we see a lot of the talk about everything being included on the data sheets with stratagems and uh, abilities as well as interactive abilities with your opponents. And that's good. Initially, index-wise, we won't see as many. But as we start to get those, those armies are going to rise to the top. We saw it at the beginning of ninth. Any army that was running on old books, old codexes, and old rules had to get FAQ'd and have a lot of extra uh, erratas and this and that just for them to function, not compete, just to function. So now we're getting a bunch of armies that can function, but are they going to be able to compete? As codexes hit, some of those are going to get pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, uh, just based on percentages. Marines are one of the most popular armies in the game entirely. So there's going to be a lot of Marine armies out there. And that means that that percentage, the win percentage and the amount of these new books percentage is going to increase exponentially. Then as other armies come out, some that are not quite as popular as Marines, we'll start to see more of the armies that can't compete and don't have the new toys that are still stuck on index start to kind of push away and not be as relevant competitively as we see. Uh, as far as the casual environment, this is one thing that I've had a couple people ask me. They say, well, if I'm working on a campaign and suddenly a codex comes out and the one of the armies gets a big buff, the army, other army doesn't, now this messes with my campaign. This is the fun thing about Warhammer. If you're doing a campaign, if you're playing at home and you're playing with your friends, nobody says you have to use the codex. You still have the indexes. So if you're running a campaign, you say, you know what, I don't care if a codex is coming out or not. We're going to stick with the indexes all the way through. And for that matter, too, if you're trying to teach someone how to play the game, you have access to the indexes to start them off and go, OK, now that we've got the basics down, now that you've learned this game, now we're going to move over to the fact that, by the way, you have this book, which makes your army more advanced. Let's start working with that. The whole focus of this edition is to make the game more easily accessible to everybody. And I see that Games Workshop is putting a lot of effort behind that. Eventually, over time, this is a complicated game. 
the complexity will come back into it. It will be difficult. It will be difficult for newer players to come in. But hopefully this is the time frame where the players that actually would want to play, this is the time that they're going to come into it. This is the time they're going to play. We're going to get them into this, and we're going to move forward with it. Now, there was one thing with uh, when we were talking about the units and the data sheets and being able to interact on your opponent's turn. And this is one thing that mildly, mildly scares me. Uh, Yanari. So back at the beginning, when they first did the indexes, was when Eldar decided to pick up a new craft world. And that was the Yanari. And it was the most busted thing. I, for one, probably number, I, I'd say top five most busted things I've ever seen in 40K. Number one still being the effects of invisibility. This was nuts. Every time you would shoot and kill a unit, then suddenly it would trigger a bunch of other units assigned to move and shoot and do all these other abilities that then you're losing guys. And it was just like, you couldn't do anything. You shoot down a unit and 20 other units prop abilities and go off and start moving and shooting. It was insane. Uh, nowhere near what Yanari is now, but this was just so busted, so off cusp and out there. That concerns me a bit is how, like they say, oh, we're going to have stuff that's going to have you interact during your opponent's turn. Personally, I'm a person that likes to sit back and watch the game unfold and hang out and let my opponent have their turn. Um, one, Lane had suggested to me that is seen in other game forms that this may be something that they do. You can interact with one unit. I like that, and I hope that that might be something that sticks. I don't have any confirmation on that at all except for some other Games Workshop uh, products, and maybe they're bringing in rules and bringing over rules. But hopefully that would be not too bad, because if you look at some armies that have like an MSU build or multiple small units, and then they have nine squads of Termagants out there on the field, and as we've seen, the Termagant says every time a unit moves within, uh, I think it was nine inches of them, then they can immediately move six inches. Well, if... You're doing that for every unit in your army. That's going to that's gonna really bog down the game. And I don't think that's Games Workshop's goal. So it might be something that it's like, okay, I move. Do you want to use a... Do you, I move. I finish my movement phase. Do you have a reaction? And at that point, you can trigger a reaction on the unit. Then you go to shoot. All right, I'm shooting with my army. I finish my shooting phase. Do you have a reaction? That I could feel... That I feel like could be... Um, a very strong way to play the game. Uh, I've seen it with Magic the Gathering, you know, you can't do something, do you have a response? You pass priority back and forth. As long as we're not passing priority for each individual unit, an individual model, then, because I see that could end up becoming very, very, very time consuming. And once again, lead, lead to the feel bad moment where you forget that someone can do something. Instead, if you have just a reaction step to the end phase, that might be an efficient way to do this. Um, so I'm hopeful on it. Uh, I'm just hopeful we don't go down a road of Yanari, which is what we saw before, where you move and suddenly the entire your opponent's army just triggers and does a whole bunch of stuff. And next thing you know, you sit there and look across the field and go, wait a minute, wasn't it my turn? Needless to say, 10th edition is going to be awesome. 10th edition is going to be the time where new players are going to be able to come into the game. Uh, my opinion, wrap it all up is get your infantry ready, uh, get ready to have like big armies of, uh, lots of foot soldiers and stuff like that during the initial index inception. That's going to be where it is. Now there may be a couple of other things that pop up that are accidental things that slip through the cracks that are really good. They might nerf them out, but I think index wise, we're going to be looking at a very infantry heavy based environment and that's just my view from what I've seen from, uh, from the history of 40K. So uh, if I was coming into this game as a new player and I just started playing this game, like, oh man, I like this army. I'm going to build this army. And now I hear there's a new edition coming out. Okay, how, how would that make me feel? So what I would do is I would find a group of guys that uh, want to play the game and know the game pretty well and just are playing some Warhammer. And pick up some game with them and have them show me and teach the game and everything like that. And just play the game and play with my models. Then 
and keep watching the news, getting infantry ready and get ready for 10th. We're looking like two, maybe three months out from 10th edition. And given the fact that for most people, if you can get one game a week, one game every other week, you're looking at what, maybe nine more games, 10 more games before 10th edition hits. Plus, you know, life happens, so that you might not even get those. So you're looking at, we're realistically getting to a point where the average standard Warhammer player is probably about seven, eight games away from 10th edition. There's a lot of us, like myself, who are getting two to three games a week while prepping for tournaments and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, there's that, but we're prepping for tournaments. Once April is done, once I finish with April, me and Lane are going to be looking at campaign games and just forging a narrative and having some thematic games to give you guys some games on the channel, bring some models out that we don't normally see, and just really go to war with some cool stuff. So that's a big point of it, too. It's like, you know, this is an opportunity to build your collection. And if you have those two choices in time of do I play a game or do I paint models and get models ready to look nice, Maybe you opt to paint the models and get stuff ready, get your tables ready, get all that stuff ready so that once 10th edition hits, you're not scrambling around to uh, get more models, get this, get that, the other. This is a good time for it. It's a good break period between it, especially for the competitive guys. This is a good time to take a little bit of a breather, relax, chill, and get ready for 10th edition because, man, once that book hits, once more of these news, rumors, and rules come out, Everybody is going to be micromanaging it to the to the letter. And we're going to see a whole bunch of craziness, a whole bunch of crazy lists. So I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you guys are too. Please let me know down in the comments section what you guys think. Do you think I'm uh, spot on with some of these assumptions? Do you remember these times? Or is there something that maybe came out just recently that I missed that completely debunks my theory? Thank you for listening. I'll